Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on September 7th, 2024, on the Gregorian calendar, which lines up with the, oh, is it the, the 24th of the sixth month, if I remember correctly? I, I don't want to misstate that, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And we are continuing in our reading of Bereshit or Genesis chapter 47. Currently, we are covering when Yaakov actually comes into the land of Goshen. So it says, and he came, this is, and went, Yahusef, but this literally is, and he came, that bow is to come. Or it says, go in or go. So you have it both ways, actually. Hmm. I'll have to look into that more. Sometimes, just to be perfectly honest with everyone, if you were to use the Strong's Concordance, one of the older versions, they're keyed to the KJV or the King James Version exclusively. And that tends to have less uh, um, less muddied up translations for a whole bunch of different words. It was before the modern translations were made. So it helps to give you a little bit of clarity. But sometimes it's not bad when you have different words for things. You can look into how it was used in other places as well but <clears throat> that tends to dilute the message if you will so whether that really is to come or to go or both i know it means to come this is and he came yahusef and told unto pharaoh or and he spoke unto pharaoh that word negad is like negad to be high and conspicuous right to be in someone's face Unto Pharaoh, and he said, Avi, my father and my brothers and flocks, or in their flocks and their herds, and all which unto them come him from the land of Canaan. It says, Wahinam, it says, and indeed they are in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers he took, right, that's to take possession of a grab, right, five men and presented them to Pharaoh. That's an interesting number. There, there's significance to this beyond what we normally see because everything's spoken in parables, but I don't want to get too much into that. I do want to, uh, when I was reminded right here in the ancient history of Caldonia, after the righteous remnant of the Caledonians from the third generation of their fall from Troy, they landed in their promised land at Mantrojan, or what became known as Montrose in Scotland. Uh, after they had founded their area there and they started spreading out, it mentioned that the, the dolums or the standing stones that they would set up along with their altars in every place that they were going Instead of the 12 standing stones before the altar, they only set up five because of the, the there were only five tribes represented in that area. Whether that or not that meant all of Caledonia at the time or just of them that were in that section, I can't say for certain, but I thought it was interesting and I was reminded of that here. It's not very relevant though. But he says, and he presented them to Pharaoh and he said, Pharaoh, to his brothers, what is your occupation or what is the things that you do? Okay. What is it that you do? And they said to him, to Pharaoh, shepherding, roe, right, to pasture, tender, graze. And for, you can see the connection there. Resh, ayin, hay. Pharaoh, and right here, if you put a hey right there, that's hero. That's where they get the word for hero, right? A mighty hunter before Yahuwah is what Nimrod was called. One of the first heroes, and he was shepherding men kind of thing. Pharaoh is hero in Egypt because the definite article is the pay. But it's just the shepherd or the hero is what he was called. And that was the title for the Egyptian kings that came from Babylon. But moving on. 
They said to Pharaoh, Shepherding the flocks, your servants, both we, and this is the proper form of the word we, this is the full anachnu, that's the whole form or the formal form of the word we, anachnu, right? When you just have the noon wa at the end of a word, a suffix attached to it, like right here, it still means we, but it's in the sense of like this is fathers, it's the fathers of us or our fathers. And that's how that that's where the suffix comes from, this word. I'm not sure if you were aware of that, but now you do. Most of the suffixes, as far as I'm aware, please, anyone more familiar, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but all of the suffixes on the words attached like this, they come from a larger word by itself that's freestanding that just attaches as a prefix or a suffix. Like for you or your, cause, cough, hey. It's usually cough, hey, on the, uh, on the end of words in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well, but the hey was generally dropped later on. Uh, moving on, though. Verse 4, it says, And he said him to Pharaoh, To dwell in the land we have come. For, or because, not pasturing of under our flocks, which that belong, or which are your servants. For severe, for heavy, literally kavad, or that's the same as kavod, where we get the word for honor or esteem. They translate that normally in the KJV as glory. Which, that's one of the things some people in the messianic persuasion take offense at. They say that that was the name of female piety, female pagan mighty ones, and you can't say it. Which uh, I'm neither here nor there about. I have not gone into it that far. But the, the intent of the meaning of the words there, I do want to point out, kavod or kavod, while it means heavy here, it, it it's also, it's like the light or the emanating light from his throne. Literally in the Psalms that you can read about it, and it's probably not this version you'll have to go over and look at different vowel points for it. Right, Same word means liver heaviness or mass. So there's different ways to be heavy, burdensome, and it also means esteem or honor, right? Point is, there's different ways that they have it. And one of the ways that you can see in scripture is it is like the light that emanates from him or like what you'd call the glory from his throne, which is what that word represents in itself too, with more than one meaning. So... Other than that, people use it or don't. I, I don't really use it myself because uh, it's just not the word that I use. I use esteem. But I don't have an issue if someone uses that. If they don't know better, especially our creator doesn't hold things against us. The entire English language would be in, incapable of use if we were to remove every element that came from something pagan. But Again, if you've followed along, you realize that the English language was originally Hebrew. And what we see is what is like the pure waters that came down from the tops of the mountains or from the Shamayim. That's like the pure Hebrew. And then as it flows down the river out to the ocean, you take some out, you put some in. And by the time it gets there, it's death to anyone who drinks it in large quantities. That's kind of the picture of what you have with what happened to the English and the other languages that bifurcated from the Hebrew. It's added things, it's taken from it. As we've done violence to our, ourselves and our fellow man, the language has changed. As we committed idolatry, the language had changed. And for his own purposes, as our ancestors were traveling, the language has changed. It's just, a, it's a phenomenon that happened that he foretold. Um, but here we go, it says, and they said to dwell, or to Pharaoh, to dwell in the land we have come, because no pasture for the flock that your servants, or there's no pasture there. For severe is the famine, or for heavy is the famine in the land of Canaan. And therefore, Yeshuvu 
it says, and therefore he will dwell him, please, or now your servants in the land of Goshen. Remember, they say please for na, but na literally means now, I pray, or now. And that's where that word came from. If you remember, in the English in particular, English from the Anglo-Saxons was a low Germanic dialect. But they tended to take the Aleph and have it, um, or the gutturals, the ayin and the Aleph, and have it become a W. It, that's why Odin be, or Adon became Woden. Eth became With. Ud became Wood. And Na became Now, and other phenomena like that. It's a very easy way to see those changes in the language there. This is now your servant to the land of Goshen. And spoke Pharaoh to Yahusuf unto saying, Abika, your father and your brothers, come him to you, right, toward you. The land of Mitzrayim, La Peneka, is before your presence. He, it's who is he, but they have it as it. In Hebrew, there is no gender neutral for it. So it's just he, she, or it based on the context. <clears throat> but he calls the land of Egypt right here a who. So to say he or it in the best of the land, ha yeshu, ha hu shab. So dwell. And then it says eth there. So it should say, in the best of land, dwell with your father and your brothers. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if, or and on the condition that you know, remember this is the word for yes, but it's and the substance or the being among them of any man competent, that word right here they have is competent, is chayil. The chayil ashat is the Proverbs 31 virtuous woman. Also the capable wife uh, that Ruth is said to be by Boaz is the chayil ashat, right? In modern Hebrew, that is a female warrior. But right here, it means strength, efficiency, wealth. They also have that as army. But if any man is competent, then make them rulers or princes of livestock. Cattle, literally. Over, which is unto me. So he's basically telling Yahusif to put his brothers over the cattle of Pharaoh. That were competent, right? And brought in Yahusif, or and he came Yahusif with Jacob his father, and he set him right here to take one stand, Ahmed. So, and he stood him before Pharaoh, or before the face of Pharaoh. And he barak, wayi barakaka, right? And he barak Yaakob at Pharaoh. And he said, Pharaoh, to Yaakob, Come on, he says, what are the days of your years? So he's like, how old are you, right? What are the days of the years of your life? And he said, Jacob to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my sojourning of Meguri, Megore, right? Which is, Agor is a sojourn. So my sojourning or the place of sojourning, a dwelling place right? Because it's the place of or the means through which you sojourn. But he says, the years of the life of my sojourning are 30 and 100 years. So 130. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life and no and have not, they have obtained at the days of the years of the life of my fathers. Meaning, Yitzhak lived to 185, Abram to 175, and Terok over 200. Before that, they were incrementally longer and longer, as you all 
are familiar with or anyone that can look at the genealogies from the Septuagint, the Masoretic, the Samaritan Pentateuch, Josephus, you name it. They all generally say the same thing. After the flood, as the wickedness and evil of men increased, our lifespans shortened. Direct correlation between the two. And you can see that phenomenon again throughout history. As the wickedness of the people, the debauchery, the blatant evil, or the sins of people generally are prevalent as a nation, their uh, people's life expectancies are generally lower than when they are walking correctly or pious. And you can see that even in our country. A lot of people were living for a long time, some still do. But the health generally goes downhill when we turn away from his words and we, uh, we listen to men or do other things. So he Baruch Yaakov at Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And he dwelt, Yahusuf, with his father and with his brothers. And he gave unto them possession. Ahuza, Ahuza. Ahuza, Ahuza, right? A possession, property, or a site. That possession, we call it, it was known as the land of Avaris back then, or the city of the Hebrews, right? Of Avar, Avery, Eber, they're, they're all interrelated words with different vowels, right? The bet and the vet, the bet and the vet are the same letter, but it is a legitimate B and V usage from antiquity with the language there. It's the only one that I'm familiar with. Um, it was called Ramses later on, but Goshen in general, and as they grew, they spread out. The history and the archaeology behind it has been known, and it's been discovered by some. I believe Tim Mahoney in his... Uh, Oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Everyone should remember him, but I'm having a I'm having a moment here. His uh, recent videos that he's done about the Red Sea crossing, the whether or not the Exodus really happened. He's done some videos along with Ron Wyatt's, which were previous to his. But in Tim Mahoney's information, he actually shows about the the cities and the things of the people in the land of Egypt from the the uh, archaeological perspective. Very well put together. Not his work, but he was talking about the people that were doing it. And um, I can't remember the name of that for the life of me, but if I do, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the chat or description or something. So we'll just move on. And it says, uh, they gave him the possession in the land of Mitzrayim, or Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, now, this is an, an, an acronym, excuse me. It's what we call an anacronym, I believe. It's where they put later translators of the text. Most likely, this would have been, and this is speculation on my part, but most likely, this would have been during the time of Ezra, just like Genesis was written, he dictated and five scribes copied down what he spoke for 40 days and 40 nights, all of the scriptures, because they were all destroyed when Babylon came in, the people didn't have anything left. And through the inspiration of the Ruach and his efforts with those other scribes, they dictated the 24 common scrolls or books to have published openly and the 70 to keep hidden only for the wise and intelligent. But it's like I was saying, it's most likely at that time that they would have put Ramses here because that was the name of the city or in the area at the time that they were familiar with. Everyone knows where Ramses is, but Avaris had been underneath it or a predecessor to it, if you will. So in the land of Ramses, Kasher as commanded Pharaoh and provided, literally, and he all all, Right, he all alled, but that means that he provided all. Yahusuf with his father and his and with his brothers, and with all the household of his father, with bread, according to their little ones. 
So with bread to the mouths of their little ones is literally the Hebrew there. That phi is the mouth. If you remember, or you might not be familiar, in the Missing Links Volume 1, there's three books that are titled The Missing Links. There's a two-volume set by Morton Spencer from the 1880s, and there is The Missing Links Found in the Assyrian Tablets, written by E. Raymond Capt, and I believe that was the 1990s or... I believe that was the early 90s, but I could be mistaken. In the first set of books, in volume one, he has a thousand proofs of the the migrations of the lost tribes and where they ended up and things of that nature. One of the things he talks about is the the shout or hip hip hooray, hip hip hooray. If you've any any of you have heard that or you're familiar with it, the the shout of the king being in them and the whole idea of a shout of the people where that came from and carried down through history is still used today or was used amongst our people in the hip hip hooray and that was a, a shout where everyone would go hip hip and then everyone would say hooray or hurrah hooah, whatever and they make a loud shout but that hip there is literally hebrew for the mouth the mouth because it's hey and then pay hip hip the mouth the mouth so it's a very interesting phenomenon, I thought, and I wanted to point out what we got to it. Here's that word for taffy again, for little one. We've also gone through seret here in the book of Genesis, which was related to Aseret or Arsereth, right? That city that was founded by the, the Hebrews that broke off and repented from those that were taken into captivity by Assyria. They were providentially helped by Yahuwah through the Euphrates, being held back as they made their way over the Caucasus Mountains, and they founded the city of Arsereth, or the land of Sereth there. But moving on, it says, Yahusif's leadership in famine. I recently came across a video from Ron Wyatt, where he postulates that Aminotep, I might not be saying his name correctly, but Aminotep from Herodotus's histories is the original Yahusuf. He was a vizier that did great things, helped build the pyramids, and um, helped consolidate the land for Pharaoh, right? I didn't really know any of that stuff, but I thought it was really fascinating, and it just came across that not too long ago. So I will share that in the description as well for everyone, and I'll put it in the telegram for everyone here too. This is, and bread, ein, is where we get the word ain't, right? None, nothing, not. And bread, not in all the land, for heavy is the famine, ma'od. Remember, that is exceeding or great. They say very here. So that languished, right, to languish or faint, so that languished Aretz Mitzrayim, so languished the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, it says because, but that's mipene, so it's from the face of the famine. They say because in English here, but it's saying that, that Egypt and Canaan fainted or languished because of the famine or the presence of the famine. And he gathered up Yahusuf eth, or with all the money, literally Kasif, I believe that's silver, okay, synonymous for money here, but he said all the silver that was found in the land of Egypt, or Mitzrayim, and in the land of Canaan, for the grain which they bought, and bought Yahusuf eth the money, or and brought, rather, and he took or and he came Yahusuf with the money into the house of Pharaoh. So when failed the money in the land of Mitzrayim and in the land of Canaan, then came all Mitzrayim to Yahusuf and said, 
Hava, this is the uh, the word for give. If you put an aleph in front of it, that's the word for love, if you remember. But to give an aleph as a word, as a prefix, means I am or I will. So love as a word, if you break it down, means I will give. But he says, give lanu, give us bread, for why should we die? It says in your presence, but that is negadka, literally conspicuously before you. For has failed, has ceased or come to an end, for has failed the money. And said Yahusuf, or and he said Yahusuf, Haba or Habu, give your livestock and I will exchange you or to you for your livestock, if is gone the money. So they brought at their livestock to Yahusuf and exchanged them, Yahusuf, bread for the horses and the flocks and the livestock of the herds for the donkeys. Thus he fed with bread for all their livestock in the year that year. And when had ended the year that year, right? And when it ended Hashina Hahu, so they say when when it ended that year in English instead of year that in Hebrew. It's just backwards. This is and when he had ended that year, then they came to him the second year and said unto him. No, never we will hide from my master. What if is gone our money and our herds of livestock also has my master or to our master? Nothing remains. So there's no remnant that Sha'ar is a remnant Nisar, right? To remain or be left over. There's nothing, there's no remnant in the sight of my master, except if our bodies, right, and our lands, why should we die? Or for, why should we die? Before your eyes. It says, both we and our land. But that it doesn't mean both. It's also moreover or yea. So you can say also us, also our land, right? By us and eth our land, bore bread, and we will be, we and our land, servants, Obedim of Pharaoh. And give seed that we may live and not die, that the land not may be desolate, So they asked for terms that they actually, because here's the thing. He told Pharaoh, and Pharaoh knew, and they went out and he set up all this stuff to accumulate grain during those years that of plenty. Everyone knew what was happening, but no one else would seem to be doing that with sufficient means to keep it for themselves. So when the, the years of plenty ceased, all these people were hurting and then they had to go get what was collected by others frugally because they were not being frugal themselves and because of that they went into slavery the ones that were provided for or had the means though were not brought into slavery at that time right this is in brought yahusuf all eth all the land of mitzrayim for pharaoh key for sold mitzrayim man his field. So every man, it says his field. The word every is supplied there, right? For was severe to be or grow firm or strong or strengthened, right? For strengthened upon them the famine. So became the land unto Pharaoh. And as for the people, he moved them into the cities from end, right, or extremity of the borders of Mitzrayim 
and to the other end, okay, the other extremity. Only the land of the priests not did he buy. For the portion to the priests by Pharaoh, they were assigned it, right? They were given hok. And that was something they were prescribed or owed, right? It was a statute from antiquity for the, um, the land of Egypt there. It says, to the priests by Pharaoh, and they ate at their rations which gave them, or which gave unto them Pharaoh, upon thus not they did sell at their lands. And said Yahusuf to the people, Indeed, I have brought you this day, or sorry, I have bought you this day and your land unto Pharaoh. Look, it's lo or behold, literally the word hey, like the letter hey, right? That's how you'd spell it. In the paleo there, it looks like a backwards E kind of slanted. It's literally like light through a window. What's revealing something or hey, pointing it out, right? But it says, look for you seed and you shall sow at the land. While you he and it came to pass right at the harvest. The product or revenue, right? That you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four of the parts shall be your own, as for the seed of the field. For your food, for those of your households, and as food for your little ones. So they said, you have saved our lives, right? You, you've preserved our lives, right? That word right there is the letter chayth in Hebrew. They actually say that it's not a word in Hebrew, but you can see it's spelled right here. You have he, the letter chayth, right there. And then the new, which is from anaknu. They translate that as saved our, and these would be the living things to live, right? It's literally in Genesis, right there in the beginning for the living creatures that went into the ark. And that's lining up with the letter chayth for that very day. So it's rather interesting. It lines up with the firmament. Chayth itself is an enclosure or a wall, a perimeter, something that separates and divides, right? But he says, you saved our lives. Let us find chen or favor in the sight of my master. And we will be servants unto Pharaoh. He says, and... Why Yashem, this is and made, but it's literally to put or place, right? Or and he there, right? To put or place or set. The word for set is also the let, like set or set. The name is to place something or to set it there. That's where we get that word. But Shem means to put something there. It's also here or there. It's where you're at, what you're known for, your name, reputation, reputation. And renown. He says, and he put Eta it Yahusuf a law. And that Ed is witnessed or to this time, right? As far as even to up to or until. Right? To the day, this or to this day, over the land of Mitzrayim, unto Pharaoh a fifth except the land of the Kohanim, or the priests, only not did they become unto Pharaoh. So dwelt Yisrael in the land of Mitzrayim, in the country of Goshen. It's a district of e Egypt, also a city in southern Yehuda. The word origin, they say, is um, different or foreign. I wonder if it has no inherent meaning in Hebrew. Goshem is rained upon. Yeah, you know, I thought that had something to do with snow or rain. Okay. So that's something interesting. Moving on. 
sometimes when you want to look at the etymology for words you'll have to dig it can't it won't just be in the strongs you also have brown drivers briggs which is a great resource and the etymological dictionary for the hebrew language for readers of english by ernest klein that is heavily promoted by our brother eric bissell in his erictology but it's a great resource for looking up the etymology and the, the origin of the words and in that one in particular, it'll give you related words there from the Akkadian and other Semitic languages and the meaning of it in the very definition of them. So it helps you trace the, the root of that word in all the, the Semitic language, if you will, to get the better sense of it. So, brother, sorry, don't mean to interrupt, but... Um... It says being rained upon in Goshen. Wasn't that a very blessed land with rain and grain production? And... Uh, it was definitely prospered. It was green and they had lots of pasture, but it wasn't rained on. They had their waters exclusively because of the arid desert environment. Right. Rain from above would have killed the vegetation but they had the floodings from the Nile that they used to provide for the land. And that was very abundant for them. Yes. All right. Thank you. You're more than welcome, brother. So dwelt Yisrael and um, the information on that about Egypt, not having rain on it. And that was actually providentially done by the forethought of our creator is expounded by Kepha in what's called the recognitions of clement i'll try to share that with everybody when i get a chance to okay so dwell or so he dwelt shub yisrael in the land of egypt in the country of goshen and they had possessions there and grew wa yaravu and he multiplied that that's rav like they get the rabbi or where we have the word rabbits, where you have exceeding multiplication, but it just means many, to become much or great or many. It says, Rabu, Rabu Ma'od, exceedingly. And here's the thing anyone can look up too. Maud, M-A-U-D. Maud is a German name. It's a female, mighty in battle, I think is what it means now, but that's, it came right from here, from Maud, right there from the Hebrew. All Germanic was Hebrew. All Celtic languages were Hebrew. They've changed over time in different ways, but you can still see the effects for it. And that, that I first knew that word in German. <laughs> so I was, I was very excited when I saw that there. This is, and lived Jacob in the land of Egypt seven and ten years, or 17 years, Yahi, and so was the age, and it, he became the days of Yaakov, the years living. Seven years and forty and a hundred, or a hundred and forty-seven years. And remember, he had said of his own mouth, laughing at his mother when she said that she was soon to die, if I come close to the, your age and in your disposition, I shall be, I consider myself blessed, or Baruch. I believe that is in the book of Yobelim. It says, and when drew near the time for Yisrael to die, then he called his son Yahusuf, or uh, then he called unto his son, unto Yahusuf, and he said unto him, if now, you see now they put it as now instead of please. If now I have found favor in your sight or in your eyes, put shim, that, that's that word, right? To put, place, or set, same thing. You see here it has a yod in it instead of being with vowel points or with a, a wa instead. This is the act of doing like the working hand. And the wa generally is the man or the one doing it kind of thing. From And again, my Hebrew is elementary. I've learned enough to read it. I've learned enough to look it up in a dictionary and dig. But I'm not fluent in speaking. 
there's many things I, I don't profess to say I'm I'm perfectly knowledgeable on. So if anything I say is incorrect when it comes to these things, please, if someone knows better, you can point it out. I'm trying to share what I do know to the best of my ability, especially when it comes to the truth of his language, because it is it is the foundation of everything that is reality, as we've been learning, right? But he says, put now your hand, excuse me, your hand under my thigh and deal with me kindly and truly, or and and deal with me chesed wa emet, with kindness or mercy and truth. Not now do bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with, right, together with my fathers, and you shall carry me, literally, nesa, right, lift up, bear, and carry me out of Mitzrayim and bury me in their burial place. And he said, Anoki Ashu, I, I will do. They just say will do here, but the Aleph is I. Again, it's I will. And then the the Ase is to do a work, deed, or action. As you have said, that kid Bareka, remember, I don't know if I've ever mentioned to you all, and I don't mean to be so distracted here and in cutting off one way or the other, but the the things with the Hebrew language, you can see quite prevalently when you take the time to look at it. We have in English, we say abracadabra when they're doing magic tricks or whatever. And that that's Hebrew for abara, or yeah, abra, abara, I create, kadabra, like or as I speak. Literally Hebrew right there. This is, and he said, swear, that is the Shiva, like a seven or an oath, it's to swear, right? Shiva. They say Shaba here, but right there, there's no dogish there. So whether it's Sheba, Saba, or Shiva, I'm not overly particular that is as a V, this is as a B. It says, swear to me, and he swore unto him. So he bowed himself, Yisrael, on the head, or the rosh, the head of the staff, or sorry, the bed. Please forgive me. Continue for a little bit. We got some time here. This is the famous part. It's very, very well known amongst people who have been looking into the lost tribes of Israel. It is the the main text you go to for trying to find out where generally they might be in the last days. But I do want to remind everyone, these are two tribes of the of the 13, technically 14, that went into the land as they were given status with the other 12 brothers, Yahusuf's children, other than them, were supposed to be named after him. But in the course of time, they were all called under Ephraim or Manasseh, even though they were the sons of Yahusuf specifically. However, these are still only two tribes out of the whole family. And if you pay attention, we'll get to them in the course of time. But it literally says in Scripture that nations and multitudes of nations, innumerable people would come from Abraham. And it's both true of the literal seed that became Yisrael and of his other seed. From them, Yitzhak was given the promise, and from them to Yaakov, and he in him was to be a multitude of nations, the fulfillment of the promises given to Sarah. And these were not just in Ephraim and Manasseh, is my point. Every one of them, became at least a great nation in themselves. You can find there was 10 kingdoms that came up at the fall of pagan Rome when they went and took it over. It broke up into the 10 of them, three of which were plucked up by the roots, as you all remember. But we'll continue here. It says, and it came to be, Achri, after 
the matters or the things these that was told unto Yahusuf. Behold, <clears throat> your father is sick. And he took Eth his two sons with him. Remember, like Yaakov, or yes, like Yaakov had taken his two sons to meet his father. This is one of those echoes where now you see Yahusuf bringing his two sons to meet his father. Although, as one was coming into the promised land, this one was outside of it going to his father instead of him coming the other way. It was inverted, if you will. This is, and he took Eth his two sons with him, Eth Manasseh, Wa Eth Ephraim, and was told Yaakov, and he said, or unto Yaakov, and he said, Behold, your son Yahusif comes to you. And he strengthened himself, Yisrael, and sat up, or and he came, or he stood, returned, if you will upon the bed. And he said, Yaakob, to Yahusuf, El Shaddai appeared to me in Luz, or at Luz, in the land of Canaan. And he barak ati, me, and said to me, Behold, I make you fruitful, and multiply you, and I will make of you a multitude of people, and give at the land this to your descendants, or literally, unto your seed. After you, a possession everlasting, or a possession of ages, literally, long duration, antiquity, fertility, olam. It doesn't mean forever. It was translated that way in the KJV. It's still translated that way 136 times, but... There's, there is not a word for eternity that I'm familiar with, like ever without end, period, because they're ages and ages. It's literally a long duration, but he rules for ages and ages that never cease, which is true. This age and the age to come, if you will, if you want to put it two ways, he breaks it down with the parable of the, the woman hiding three measures in until all is measured, so three ages, if you will. And that kind of thing is alluded to in the patriarchs and other places. The point is, it, it doesn't mean forever or everlasting, but it is an age. And it was for an age that they possessed the land. That's true. <laughs> Excuse me. It says, Now two sons born to you in the land of Mitzrayim before I came to you in Mitzrayim, unto me, hem. So uh, unto me they are, basically, they are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh, as Reuben and Simeon, or Shimon, so as the first and second born, they shall be mine. And this is why they get the birthright covenant Baraka, because he takes them and adopts them like he's the firstborn. And your offspring, whom you beget after them, unto you shall be. Meaning they were supposed to be of Yahusuf. By the name of their brothers, they, sh they will be called in their inheritance. There you go. So they're unto Yahusuf, but they'll be called by Ephraim and Manasseh. It says, but I, or and I, when I came from Padan, died besides me Rachel in the land of Canaan on the way when but a little distance or a little land to go Ephrath all right so from a little distance from the land of Ephrath and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath that is Bethlehem or Bethlehem and he saw Yisrael at the sons of Yahusuf, and he said, Who are these? And he said, Yahusuf, to his father, My sons, they are, right? My sons, him, whom or which has which given unto me Elohim in this place. 
or here, right? And he said, bring them now to me and I will Barak them, right? And I will bless them. And the eyes of Yisrael were dim. That's kibidu. That is related to heavy, weighty, burdensome. That same word for honor, esteem, or what they, like I said in the KJV, called glory. But it says, and his eyes were dim with age. That zokin is, um, I believe it's a word for beard. Yeah, the beard or chin. The elders, that's the word for elders or old age. An elder is the um, equivalent there. The zakanim or the elders in the congregation. And that just means the bearded ones. They're the ones that had a longer beard than others because they had time to grow. But it says, and... The eyes of Yisrael were heavy with age, not, never he could unto seen, or not he could unto seen. And Yahusuf brought, right, that's that, Gimel Sheen. So they have that translated as to draw near or approach. If you put the noon on the other side, that's Goshen. So that's an interesting uh phenomenon there they dwelt in the land where they came near and approached but moving on it says and he brought near at them to him and he kissed them and embraced them and said and he said Yisrael to Yahusuf see your face not I had thought right to intervene or interpose so to see your face, not I had interposed, right? And behold, he has shown me, Aleph Tal, Yod, right? Me, Elohim, also, eth your seed. So he brought Yahusuf them from beside his knees, and he bowed down with his face to the ground. Or that's literally with his is that his face or his mouth? Yeah, his nose, anger, face. Okay, his off. The off is the nose. The unoff is used for anger. When it flares, his nostrils is another. It's a euphemism for when he's angry in the Hebrew. But and he bowed with his nose or nostrils to the ground. And he took Yahusuf, the two of them, Ephraim, with his right hand toward toward the left hand of Yisrael, and Manasseh with his left hand toward the right hand of Yisrael, and brought them near him, and, and he stretched out, or and he shleach, and he sent out Yisrael at his right hand, and laid it on the head of Ephraim. And he was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, and this is and crossing, but that's sikel, almost like shekel, to be prudent. That's the word for mishkal, with the word for intelligence throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls, where it says the writing of the intelligent there. It's not commonly translated correctly in the Proverbs either in a few places, but it means intelligence, right? He crossed his hands intelligently, F his hands for Menashe, the firstborn. And this is the sign. It's providential. They have this thing. If you look at the American flag, you have the straight lines on it. But on the British flag, it's crossed. And even in Scotland and Ireland, that's part of that crossed flag insignia, the emblems of that nation, if you will, to point out who it represents right there. And F Menashe being the other one. Right, the great nation and then the company of nations, but we'll get to that in a minute. He says, And he Baruch eth Yahusuf and said, The Elohim whom walked, right? To come go or walk, halak, right? 
who walked with my fathers before Abraham and Yitzhak, the Elohim who has fed me all my life, right, all up until this point. Going around, continuance yet, still again, or besides. To the to this day, right? To the day, Haza, this. Hamelech. So he's talking about the Elohim, and we've covered that before. You see Ha Elohim mentioned throughout Genesis. It's the Elohim that is our father through his son doing these things and he does that through the messenger right who the one that appeared to him he calls the melek yahuwah and that is our mashiach pre-incarnate if you will this is the one he's talking about i'll read it again he says any baruch yahus and he said the elohim whom walked before my fathers abraham and yitzhak the elohim who has fed me all my life to this day the messenger who has redeemed me from all evil. Ye Barak eth Hana Adar. Uh, you, you bless the lads, right? Or the boys. And he and let, and this one's important, why ye kara, and he will call behem upon them, Shimi, my name. So the name of Yisrael was to be called upon Ephraim and Manasseh. This is the important thing here. It's not called on all of them. So a lot of the stuff where they talk about where Ephraim is in prophecy, it doesn't mention where all of the 12 tribes are everywhere, but Ephraim and Manasseh specifically. Because if you read about what they did to Yahusuf, they conspired against him. They took him, they sold him to the Ishmaelim, who are a parable of the original covenant believers and then from there was sold into egypt right to be mistreated and everything that happened but that was the other brothers of israel doing that to them and they weren't named by that in history while they were doing that to the ones that were walking correctly or trying to be the bearers of the good news if you will back on point here he says, let my name be upon them, my name, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Yitzhak. And that's the key right there. Because Yisrael, even in his life, after he was named Israel, or Yisrael, if you will, he was not called that all the time. And he was actually called, told to be that name twice. It was given to him. And after the second time, before they went into Egypt, if you will, that's when he was called Yisrael exclusively. As far as I'm aware, he's not called Yaakov after then. But that's a type of what was happening where the, the children, when they went out of the land, would have his name taken from them. While when he went out of the land, it was given and he never had it deviated. So there's, again, there's that inversion that we've talked about. But another key is that in Yitzhak, their seed, or your name shall be called, is another foretelling that was given elsewhere. And right here you can see, let the name of Yitzhak be called upon them. That would be the Sakai of antiquity. The Yitzhaka of the Assyrians, the Sakai, the Saxons, the Sakasani, and everywhere that they went, called by Yitzhak's name, as it was foretold. Says, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the land, which is a phenomenon that they did. If you, I don't agree with everything that they share, but there is, um, there's a massive amount of information about this. There's a two-hour video just recently shared in the Telegram from Stephen Collins, and he's a gentleman that's written five books, four of them still in print on the topic of the lost tribes and he he goes around and speaks on them so he talks about the literal fulfillment of this where they became a multitude in the midst of the land where they grew into a larger multitude 
outside of the promised land after their captivity by the Assyrians than they did when they were in the promised land. So just as they grew into a multitude in Egypt, after they were plucked up, they also grew into a multitude. And they became known as the Scythians of antiquity, which took over all of the Middle East at one point for almost 30 years. And they also became known as the Parthian Empire, which was the Scythians were the great nation, a foreshadow of America at the time. The people of America would be later on. That was a microcosm of it. And then the Parthian Empire was a nation and company of nations in a microcosm, if you will. But I say microcosm, although those generally the landmass of the Parthian Empire was greater than the general island of Britain, but the whole of the British Empire was larger than that one. So there's some contrast there. But um, the unitedness of their kingdom all being in one area, they, they had a lot of benefit at that time that was diminished as time goes on because of the inequity of the people willingly doing things wrong that cause problems. The same is true in our lives. I'm not trying to point out things to point fingers and say, oh, look how wrong they are. But to point out that these things happen because his word is true and he's trustworthy even when we're not. So we have to learn from not only our mistakes, but the mistakes that our forefathers made and try to correct all of them. Excuse me. Verse 17 or not correct, but repent. Just like it says, we have to repent of our sins and the sins of our forefathers. We will confess and turn from them, and that's when the benefit and change happens. But until then, we keep getting the fruits of you know, our actions and what we deserve, individually and nationally. And he saw, Yahusuf, that he set his father's hand, his right hand, upon the head of Ephraim, and it was evil, why ye ray, and he, and he was evil, to be evil or bad, literally, and it was evil to him, or in his eyes, literally, so he took the hand of his father to remove it from upon the head of Ephraim, to, or upon the head of Manasseh, and said Yahusuf to his father, Never so, or Loken, right? Not so, my father, for this the firstborn, Habikar, set or put your right hand upon his head. But he refused his father, and he said, I know, my son, I know. Also, he shall become a people, La'am. And that's the, uh, that's one of those things, just like the Lawler, the Roundheads, the, the key words, the bad eye or the exile that became the Buddhists, the Budai, right? All these words that you find in scripture have a literal significant historical fulfillment in history. The fact that we shall become a people is, is one of those key words you can go around and find all throughout history there's some groups of men that call themselves the people all over the place deutschland germany is the land the people's land dutch means of the people laity which was a, a latinized or romanticized group of germans means of the people the nicolaitans were the conquerors of the people right but the laitim were literally of the people the Laos, which is a Greek word for the people, is an Asian Buddhist group, but they're of the people. Right? All of these names are pointers to who they represent. And they're not the only ones, but they're the ones that I'm most familiar with. And then you have all throughout the common law countries, we are literally the people referenced as them in all of our documents. Don't want to jump in so quickly. But can you expand more on the Nicolaitan part for those that might have not heard? Uh, yes. So the Nicolaitans, 
just in the words itself, the Nico is to strike, like Pharaoh Nico, when Yoash Yahu, or they call him Josiah, was the king, and he actually kept, um, he was contemporary with the Scythians when they became powerful. The northern kingdom, the Menashe, if you will, that had repented, and they swept through the Middle East. They, remnants of them, the Scythians that were in the land at that time, kept the feast with Josiah or Yoash Yahu. And it's mentioned in scripture that there was none like it at that time. There were so many that were able to keep it. But it was just a, 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 the ones that were in the land of them at that time, of that 28-year period. But back on point, Nico means to strike or to smite. And then Laetin is, like I said, it means of the people. It's the name of the followers of Nicholas, who was the proselyte from Antioch, if you will. He was the taught one originally from the city of Antioch that became um, a deacon. I think you call him a deacon in, in modern language right that comes from the latin but it's the ministers if you will they were the ones that were enjoined by kepha and the others for the yarushalayim assembly to minister to the poor the widow and the orphan to give them the food and things that were gathered in tithes and just for clarity our mashiach was like the sun the greater light of the world the malkuth shamayim the kingdom of the heavens is like the moon which is what they were literally established in, in fact, what he came to preach, right? And the children of light were all the assembly set up, like the constellations running the course set before them, set up sun, moon, and stars, fourth day parallel there. The, um, the Nicolaitans, just like you have the seven planets, two of them are not visible, you have the seven deacons, and two of them are not visible. Stephen became a martyr, and Nicholas went apostate. His going apostate was the Nicolaitan movement, which was the conquering of the people, which culminated in a conspiracy with Vespasian and Titus and the Roman Empire and the uh, promulgation of what you'd call Catholicism. If you want to really dig into all of that and learn the nuances of the history and get the, the facts behind it, the foretellings and revelation, the actual fulfillments of the things, and all the evidence that you possibly could want or need on the subject, you can look at the Antichrist for Dummies video series, and it goes over all of that. But um, the word is what we were looking at for the importance there. The Nicolaitans, tragically, is what became... Catholic Christianity, but it was foretold there as a conquering over the people, which is exactly what it did, and what you can read that they don't follow the injunctions of Yahushua, who said, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, but now it is not of this world. So the ones doing the fighting now are not of his kingdom, pretty simple says, but refused his father. And he says, I know my son, I know, but they shall also become a people. And also he shall be great, Yigdal, all right? And that's that great nation, which is what America became, also foretold in Revelation. You can see it elsewhere. Um, we've talked about it a few places too. The dove in the wilderness, it's alluding to it. The, the time of the people in the wilderness and what they were doing there also alludes to America uh, <laughs> coming out of Egypt and removing that mixture, right? But we have the inverse. It's been the mixture and the pollution being added to us. So again, you can see these things, Father willing, more clearly as we go along. But he says, and he shall be great, but truly his brother, the younger Yigdal, right? greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude, the melo ha-goyim, melo ha-goyim, the fullness of the nations. This is what, um, shall, yeah, fullness, that which fills, melo, 
And then Hagoim is the Gentiles or the nations, people. And that is what Ephraim was going to be, the what the British Empire became. It filled up all the places where the other tribes were not. And that became collectively, prophetically, if you will, Ephraim. Uh, the fact that Yahushua reigns over every nation today is because the good news has gone out to them. And wherever the truth is gone, he reigns. Even if they don't acknowledge him, that doesn't mean that it, his word isn't true. That's the thing we have to keep in mind. But it says, and then again, we mentioned the Meloha Goim. Shaul foretold that the veil would be over them in part until the fullness of the nations come. And when the British Empire began to become manifest in its fullness and the promises and the, and the blessings of Scripture were being fulfilled literally in them, that was when the veil was starting to be lifted and people realized that they were of the tribes of Israel in that country. They're not the only ones. They're just one of 12 tribes or 13. But again, it, it is a great blessing or a benefit to know the truth. It says, and he barak them in the day that saying unto them or unto saying in you, he will barak Yisrael saying, he will put you Elohim as or like Ephraim and like Manasseh. And thus he set Eph Ephraim before the face or before the presence of Manasseh. And since that time, even on to our times, Ephraim's been given the preference. They've had the leadership, if you will, second in in order to Yahuda when the kingdom was split. It was never given to Manasseh, but you can see remnants of Manasseh's prominence and foreshadowing things of our country in the times of the judges in Yiftach, in Gideon, and the judges of Manasseh that were ruling in that time. Before there was a king, Manasseh was prevalent. After there was a king, it was Ephraim. While there was a king, Ephraim was prevalent. Afterwards, it was America, Manasseh. Right? Same picture. Yamor, and, and he said, Yisrael, to Yahusuf, Behold, I am dying, and it will be, or and it became, or and it is, or it's cause, sorry, but will be, right, to fall out or come to pass, hiya, right? But it will be Elohim with you. I am a chem. That word, um, Yahuwah, I am a chem, is what Boaz would say to the workers of the field, Yahuwah be with you. And they would say, Yibarekaka, Yahuwah, or, and he barak you, Yahuwah. So I always appreciate that one. And I try to always say that is my greeting. Yahuwah would be with you, right? Or Yahuwah Barak you. We, just for context there too, it says that it's beyond all question that the lesser is Baruch by the greater. And we're given in the apostolic constitutions and throughout the scriptures, you can see that those in positions of authority can Baruch or give blessings to those that are lesser than them and they're equal but they should not be giving blessings or baraka to those that are above their station. So if there is a high Kohen in our land, or for example, if we were in a, a real assembly, a physical assembly, and we had chosen amongst ourselves by unanimous consent an overseer, and everything was lawfully done, then he could give us a baraka, we could give each other a baraka or blessing, but we could not give him a baraka. It would not be permitted to do so, just for context there. It says, I am dying, but Elohim will be with you and will return with you to the land of your fathers. Moreover, he has given to you one portion, it, this is Shechem, right? A shoulder. One, Achad, upon or over your brothers. 
which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. And right here, the battles that he did with the Amorites with his sword and bow, we have no record of in the common scriptures that I'm familiar with. But we do see that in the, the uh, Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Dead Sea Scrolls, I was going to say, but they, the fragments are in there. However, Yobelim and the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs do cover that in some detail. Probably not as much as we used to have, though. But thank you all for your time. I think that might cover what we're able to do for today. You all have a great Shabbat and a Shavuot Tov a week ahead, and we will see you next time.